Okay, I'll uh, carry on now. And this is a continuation of Joel's talk, which was excellent. And there'll be a little bit of overlap here. So I've been asked to talk about the anterior wall slash column plus posterior me transverse uh, fractures. So the objectives here are to talk about the radiology, uh, decision making and some treatment uh, ideas. Now this is in uh, chapter 13 of Lichenel's textbook. And in his series, uh, the percentage of this uh, subtype was 6.58%. And in our experience at our institution at Sunnybrook, we're seeing more and more of these variants and combined with the anterior column wall as people uh, stay more active into their uh, older years. The primary fracture line is the anterior wall and or column, as you can see here schematically, here's the anterior wall drawn out. And then the secondary fracture line is the posterior column coming at an angle uh, approximately 90 degrees from the anterior column fracture. Now, if we go through the radiographic features, uh, for the most uh, of these types, five out of the six lines will be involved. The, the posterior rim or uh, 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 wall will not be involved, but the iliopectineal line will be disrupted here because you have involvement of the anterior uh, wall slash column. The teardrop and the anterior rim are involved as you get uh, medialization of those uh, findings with displacement of the anterior wall or column. Now the ileocial line can be disrupted. And as we heard from uh, Dr. Sims uh, a couple of weeks ago, this can be simply involvement of the quadrilateral surface as you heard from Joel, even in an anterior column, you can have involvement of the quadrilateral surface which can disrupt your ileocial line or it can be involvement of the posterior column and rotation medially of the quadrilateral surface as it attached as it is attached to the posterior column. The distinction, as we'll hear from uh, Dr. Mayo with regards to the associated both column, is there is a segment of the roof that is intact in the anterior column wall uh, posterior me transverse. And then medially, uh, this can be impaction, but most commonly, this is rotation of the component of the anterior column. And we'll go through that a little more uh, detail in the coming slides. With regards to the posterior column, it's at variable location, but it's often low at the area of the ischial spine. And it's usually uh, minimally displaced, but in some variants, as I'll show, it can be significantly displaced. If we look at the Jude views, on the obturator oblique view, again, you can see that segment of the acetabular roof intact in this case. You can see rotation and displacement of the anterior column, which is hinged on the uh, upper segment of the pubic rami uh, in this situation, and medialization of the head, and then that uh, fracture of the posterior column as it exits. Now, if you have a lower posterior column, it can actually bisect or transect the uh, teardrop and disrupt that uh, more completely. Now, there is a fracture of the inferior pubic rami in this case, and you can say, well, why isn't this a T-type uh, or a T-shaped fracture? And we'll go through that in a couple of slides, uh, the distinction between the two, as Dr. Riley pointed out last week in his talk with regards to the T-shape. On the iliac oblique, again, you can see that intact portion of the acetabular roof. You can see rotation or involvement of the uh, quadrilateral surface with uh, attachment to the posterior column. And then you can see, uh, and uh, again, that exit uh, more cranially, if you will, of the posterior column. And again, in this situation, that true impaction that will delineate more with the CT scan. Now, if we go through the axial cuts, and this is a situation where, you, you know, I put up six cuts here, but you really need to study this uh, more, more precisely. But one of the benefits here, or one of the keys here is to actually put the cursor, in this case, I put a star on the intact, uh, portion of the um, uh, acetabulum, if you will. And then just as you scroll down through the cuts, keeping in mind, and this is the intact portion, which uh, makes it uh, different and distinct from the associated both column. But what you can see here is anteriorly is that involvement of the anterior column, the low anterior column as it extends down, uh, just in this region uh, here, as it starts in the region of the anterior inferior spine, the top and rotation. And that was what we thought was impaction. But in fact, that's rotation of that anterior wall as it rotates cranially and medially. And again, here's the uh, segment as it bisects the articular surface uh, anteriorly. 
just as you follow it down. And then you can see involvement of the quadrilateral surface just in this area and the vertical fracture line that uh, is the posterior column involvement, making it an anterior uh, column, a low anterior column and a posterior transverse with involvement of the quadrilateral surface and some impaction, which is most commonly posterior superiorly. And then the more caudal cuts showing again, rotation of the quadrilateral surface. It probably has an incomplete fracture line just in this area as it uh, joins up with the posterior column. Now, if we go right to the 3D uh, scans, and again, I think uh, as Joel pointed out, uh, studying the 2D reconstructions, and we'll show this in a couple of cases, is very important to delineate where the impaction is. But again, on these 3D cuts, you can see the intact portion of the uh, acetabular roof. You can see the segmental, or what Lertronel calls the trapezoid nature of the anterior wall slash column. And then uh, again, seen on the uh, oblique projection, rotation of the quadrilateral surface. And you can see just in this area, the exit of the posterior me transverse. And this correlates here to this uh, axial cut just shown here. And then if we do a 3D projection more the iliac oblique, if you will, you can see the exit of the posterior column a little higher than in some uh, variants. And then again, the intact uh, acetabular roof. And again, correlation to the axial cuts, you can see again that this uh, is the exit of the posterior column and where the star is, is essentially that intact acetabular roof. So as Dr. Riley pointed out last week, comparison to the T-shape, the T-shape has a fairly characteristic uh, pattern, but the distinction here is that trapezoid or segmental nature of the anterior wall of the column, there's still of that uh, involvement of the uh, posterior column and, basically 90 degree um, projection into the posterior column from that anterior involvement. And again, if we look at the 3D scans, uh, again, a fairly uh, characteristic pattern for the T-shape, which exits uh, more vertically. You can see again that it uh, does exit. Uh, this is the anterior column posterior transverse of another case we'll come to in a second. That exit can occur in the through the obturator foramen, but it tends to be more anterior. And again, you can see on this projection, coming more along the anterior column. And this is the exit uh, again of the uh, posterior column. So you can see that there's kind of a transition almost, but the key distinction is this segmental nature of the anterior column wall. And again, showing that more uh, anterior, if you will, uh, exit of that fracture line. One of the keys also is displacement of the femoral head and the T-shaped fracture as shown here. The femoral head tends to follow the posterior column as compared to the anterior wall posterior me transverse, which the femoral head will follow the anterior wall column as shown on the right. The comparison to the associated both column, again, in the, as you'll hear from Dr. Mayo in the associated both column, uh, shown on the right here, there is no remaining attachment of the uh, acetabular roof or uh, joint uh, surface to the intact ilium as compared to the anterior column posterior me transverse where you have a small or variable portion size attached to the intact ilium. And so if we look at the uh, images uh, just of an anterior column posterior transverse superiorly there, you can see again in this case, there's a, a portion of the acetabular uh, roof that is intact and attached to the intact ilium as compared to the associated both column where there is no remaining joint surface attached to the intact pelvis and this showing the spur sign, which again, you'll hear from Dr. Mayo in a few minutes. The variables, uh, they can be uh, many with regards to the fracture lines, but also there can be significant impaction as Joel uh, alluded to in his talk. Usually this is posterior superior. So here is the uh, 2D reconstruction, both in the sagittal and coronal. So there can be true impaction in this situation and it's important to delineate this and also quantify it on your plane films which are important in the operating room that we'll see in a couple of seconds. And here's the 3D with the, the head subtracted in this case, and you can see that posterior superior impaction. As I've mentioned, there can be quadrilateral plate involvement. This can be separate or attached to the posterior column, and it can be highly comminuted as well. With regards to the posterior column, again, it can be minimally displaced, or in this situation, you can see a fairly significant displacement of that uh, posterior column exit fracture and this is just a 3D correlate. 
The treatment options uh, range from non-operative to uh, open reduction internal fixation, and that's usually the default, that's internal fixation. In a small percentage, you may consider a primary total hip either with or without open reduction internal fixation of the anterior column. What goes into the decision making? Well, there's obviously many factors and those, that includes the patient factors and also the surgeon factors, but also the fracture characteristics. And we know from many studies and those from Lutronel and, and Joel Mata and others that there are significant risk factors for, for poor results in all acetabular fractures and, and this subtype is no exception. Age greater than 60, a little lower in Mata series. Uh, and again, that's probably physiologic age as opposed to chronologic age. But the two things that we're dealing with here with this subtype are acetabular impaction with free intraarticular fragments, whether there's febrile head involvement. So that's where it really comes in and, and becomes key studying the images and, and also uh, knowledge of the patient factors. Just a word about non-operative treatment. This is very rare. And this was a study out of shock trauma a couple of years ago. And over an 11 year period, they treated 26 cases and it can be treated and very, very rarely in our institution, when patients are, are virtually a, a medical contraindication of surgery, we may consider this. More commonly, we're thinking about uh, individuals that have perhaps uh, older population that can only withstand one operation. They have medical issues, and this is one case where the patient had medical in issues, they had impaction, uh, femoral head problems on the imaging, and they had pre-existing arthritis. And you're healed for more for this uh, from Dr. Kreider in, uh, in two weeks with regards to this uh, treatment uh, uh, strategy for these individuals. As mentioned, the, the default is internal fixation. I think first is key is consultation. So with your colleagues uh, uh, deciding on those patients that may fall into the category of uh, uh, total hip arthroplasty, but I think for the vast majority, uh, you're looking at internal fixation. We talked a little bit about uh, tables last week. In our institution, we use both. Uh, we tend to uh, use more radiolucent table depending on how much help we have. The benefit of that, as you heard last week, is that you can flex the hip. And when these fractures are very low, you really need to have access. And unfortunately, they, the fractures often become right behind the psoas. And so you'll need to add not only the ilioinguinal, but the anterior interpelvic approach as well. In certain subtypes, and I'll show a case of this, you may consider an additional posterior approach. But I think for reduction, I think as Joel mentioned, repositioning the femoral head is key. So lateral and distal traction, and then the buttress plates uh, for the column and consideration of the quadrilateral surface, and finally quantifying and dealing with the impaction. So here's a case, this is a 70 year old fall falling off a bike. And again, you can see the characteristic rotation of the anterior column and that double density, and that may be the anterior column, but most likely that's involvement of the iliacal line as it rotates medially, and it may or may not be attached to the posterior column. There's our intact acetabular roof. That's likely rotation of the anterior, the low anterior column wall, and then the uh, exit uh, of the posterior column fracture on the AP. If we look at the iliac oblique, again, there's true impaction now, just in that posterior superior area that we've talked about. There's rotation and displacement of the posterior column, and there's the intact uh, uh, acetabular roof as seen. There's no extension into the iliac wing, so this would be a low anterior column, if not a wall. And then on the obturator oblique, you can see involvement of the anterior column. And then on the CT scan, as you go through the axial cuts, you can again see the fairly low anterior wall. You can see in this region the uh, impaction, that double density that you see, and then some comminution. So you know right away there's some comminution at the brim and into the quadrilateral surface. You can see the exit, in this case, of the posterior wall. There's the impaction. And then we follow that down more caudally and you can see again the exit of the posterior column fracture. If we look at the 2D reconstruction, the sagittal and coronal, you can again see the, the impaction, the true impaction in that posterior superior area. Now we had a, uh, a request from the participants to look at the video from uh, Dr. Riley and Ferguson about drawing the fracture. I'm gonna take a crack at it here just for the sake of time. I'll go through this fairly quickly, but one of the nice things on the axial is to quantify, get landmarks. So here I've just put a star in the anterior inferior spine, and this correlates to this dry erase pelvis, which I think is very valuable 
when you start to draw these, you can uh, erase your mistakes. And we start making, as you can see here, that anterior wall starts just in the region, just a little bit caudal to the anterior inferior spine. And then as we follow down on the cuts, and you obviously wanna have more of these cuts up as you start to draw it. But as mentioned in the video, you start making dots on where these fractures exit. I've made them fairly large here just for the sake of being able to see them. And then you connect these dots and this comes up with our low anterior wall slat, or sorry, low anterior column. You can see just in this region, there's some comminution along the brim. So there's something going on. Uh, I'll just mark it in there on our uh, brim area. And then there, there's the impaction, as I mentioned, and this is in the posterior superior area. And if you follow the cuts down, you can sort of get an idea and guesstimate, if you will, or estimate where that impaction uh, occurs. And then exit of that posterior column a component of the anterior column posterior transverse, which this uh, would constitute. Now, if we look at uh, the exit along the quadrilateral surface, again, here's our anterior, low anterior column, our uh, involvement uh, in the quadrilateral surface slash uh, brim, just along here, and here's our exit uh, in through the uh, greater sciatic notch of that posterior column extension. If we turn this, the uh, dry erase over, Again, using the anterior inferior spine as our landmark, we know that that posterior column fracture uh, line is a little, just a little caudal to that. So it's exiting probably a little lower than that, but in the region of the greater sciatic notch, just in this region. So then we can go to the 3D correlates and see how we did. So again, we see that impaction. We see this segmental, excuse me, the segmental nature of that anterior, low anterior column, just in this region, and that exit of the posterior column into the greater sciatic notch area. So the surgical tactic for this uh, will be positioning in this situation at supine. And as uh, Dr. Saji pointed out last week, that if you anticipate going through the anterior intrapelvic window, you don't wanna bump the patient up. That will, will actually encourage the femoral head to go more medial. You wanna approach this through an ilioinguinal approach. In this situation, we added the uh, AIP window or the fourth window. Again, reduction of the femoral head with inline traction. In this situation, we did it on the radiolucent table uh, with inline traction and then lateral traction of the femoral head. Initially, it's gonna be anterior wall and column uh, exposure and stabilization as Joel talked about, initially with temporization with K-wires. And if the fracture is high enough, such as uh, in an anterior column, as Joel showed, you may consider lag screws. In this situation, it's fairly low. So it's gonna be very close to the joint and you won't be able to get lag screws in this situation. You want to address the impaction and again buttress the anterior column, grafting screws for that disimpacted impaction, and then consideration about the quadrilateral surface. So here we are here. We want to reduce this. And again, Dr. May will go through this. This clamp is placed, uh, this is a little higher, this just schematic, but you can use the uh, uh, clamps as Joel pointed out to, just to reduce this. Often when it's low, you're using a, a spike ball pusher. And then in this situation as shown, you're using a temporization with key wires and you can see the femoral head's been repositioned and just showing the uh, oblique views just to reestablish the uh, anterior wall slash column. Next would be assessment of the impaction. And uh, that's why it's so important in my opinion to quantify this impaction on the plain film Jude views. So you can see in this situation, just on the oblique view interoperative you can see the asymmetry and that impaction of the joint surface. And so as Joel pointed out, this is uh, uh, taken again from uh, uh, a schematic. You can work through the fracture, but in this situation, uh, we've already reduced the anterior wall. You can also access it through the AIP window. If you have comminution, you're able to rotate that quadrilateral surface and within inline traction, you may be directly able to visualize that impaction uh, of the articular surface. In this situation, uh, we used uh, intraoperative imaging in addition to that uh, window through the quadrilateral surface. And then just a schematic. So we're localizing that impaction with a K-wire under fluoroscopic control. We're following it down. You can see just in this area where we've, I've just uh, drawn this out, uh, where that impaction is uh, seen on the radiograph. So you're using biplanar or uh, multiple oblique views, both on the obturator oblique and the iliac oblique to quantify where that impaction is. And then you can use either cannulated or in this situation, these are solid uh, exchangeable punches. So we make a window using a uh, quarter inch osteotome where the K-wire was. And then we use our punch as we would uh, such as a tibial plateau 
to follow this down and quantify where it is on the uh, iliac oblique imaging. You can see a spike ball pusher holding uh, the uh, anterior column in place. We've got our K-wires loaded, ready to go. And you can see a congruency as best we can, can tell on the uh, imaging, but also what we've been able to do is visualize this directly through the AIP window to assess the uh, disimpaction of the uh, our impacted articular surface. And then we impact the subchondral wires across this surface as a rafting technique. The next thing is going to be uh, placing the anterior column plate as uh, shown by Dr. Uh, Williams. And again, this can be variable length in this situation and we wanna stabilize it proximally and distally. And then we're slowly replacing and buttressing that anterior uh, column wall and then replacing our, uh, our K wires. Now with reduction of the quadrilateral surface posterior column, again, Dr. May will talk about this in his talk. This is an offset clamp and where is this placed? Uh, generally around the region of the anterior inferior spine. Now you can work lateral through your lateral window, lateral to the psoas, or you can work across and through both the lateral window and the middle window. This depends a bit on uh, how big that psoas is. You, you have to run the risk of uh, crushing that psoas and obviously the femoral nerves in that area. So again, if you do this on the fracture table, you'll tend to not be able to flex as much and you'll have to work through both the lateral and middle window. If you're able to flex up a little bit more, such as in a radiolution table, you can work lateral to the psoas and down through the, the brim. So this is just showing the clamp placement for the posterior column as uh, Dr. Mayo will, will also deal with. This is a disc, so it can distribute the forces in the anterior, uh, sorry, in the quadrilateral surface. I would encourage you when you do this to place a suture on that disc, uh, just in case the disc comes, becomes dislodged from the clamp itself. And then we're just modifying and assessing our reduction, you can see there's a, an imperfect reduction of that posterior column. And we've modified this clamp on several occasions to try and improve the position. And then we're working through the plate to get both posterior column fixation. We're also buttressing as we compress that screw down on the anterior column to act as a, a buttress of the anterior column component. And thirdly, we're also placing screws fairly subchondral. So we're rafting that impacted, disimpacted uh, portion of the articular surface. You can see that uh, screw close to the joint is larger caliber for the, from the 3.5 in this, that's a 4.0 cortical screw to add some increased fixation in this fairly osteopenic situation. And finally, we're placing a screw from the anterior inferior spine across uh, a subchondral to act as a secondary uh, buttress or rafter, if you will, of that subchondral surface. And this is uh, just showing uh, the final construct, uh, you can see slightly imperfect uh, reduction of the posterior column. One of the things that also comes up is uh, this so-called, uh, some people call this the quote-unquote Luttrell screw, as it comes between the uh, articular surface and the obturator foramen. You can see the trajectory of this, and this adds fixation in an osteopenic situation between the anterior and posterior columns into that uh, anchoring in that strong uh, bone in the ischium. And this is a different case uh, just showing where the trajectory of that screw is in the obturator uh, oblique view. And interoperatively, generally, you're doing an obturator uh, view to uh, place that screw safely, usually through the middle window of the iliunguinal. What about if you have residual displacement of the posterior column or you're unhappy with the reduction? Then you may have to consider, much like uh, Dr. Riley uh, mentioned last week with the T-shape, you may have to consider doing a sequential approach, taking the fixation out of the posterior column and then uh, doing a sequential posterior uh, approach to reduce that posterior column. So if you have displacement of the posterior column, you may need to develop that towards the notch as Dr. Sadji pointed out last week to allow clamp placement onto the posterior column. You may plan a, sequ a sequential posterior approach and I'll show a case of that in a second, or there may be an incomplete reduction where you may need to remove the fixation for the posterior column. And uh, again, ensure that that impaction is stabilized but then do a sequential posterior approach. And this is a case from Dr. Riley, quite dramatic uh, displacement and dislocation of the femoral head. This is the reduction, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. Again, the characteristics of an anterior column, uh, uh, anterior wall, uh, posterior amy transverse. You can see dis significant displacement of that posterior column initially, just shown here on the 3D views. And the plan here, based on uh, the interpretation, was to start with a cochlear Langenbeck to fix the posterior amy transverse. Uh, sequentially, you can see fixation, again, of the displaced greater trochanter fracture. 
and then do a sequential ileoinguinal with sequential fixation that we've talked about. You can see the mini fragment plate or a multi-fragmentary anterior wall. And this is shown at approximately nine months postoperatively with a, a, a good a radiographic outcome. Lastly, what about a comminuted quadrilateral surface with impaction? And I think Joel alluded to this. It's uh, often a, a dilemma whether you need to place a quadrilateral plate surface, but for me, uh, if I have impaction and I want to really contain the femoral head and, and deal with the impaction, that's when I'm starting to think about a quadrilateral surface plate. Again, the characteristics of an anterior column posterior medial transverse, uh, comminuted quadrilateral surface, which are separate from the uh, posterior column. And this is a really trans transitional. You can say that this may be representative of an anterior column. In Lutzernell series, he had a series of incomplete uh, posterior column involvement in the anterior posterior medial transverse, and this is probably a variant of that. And again, just showing uh, an ileoinguinal approach with a fourth window, disimpaction of the articular surface, and then sequential fixation with subchondral rafters. And because of the degree of comminution of the quadrilateral surface, I felt that it was important to contain the impaction and the femoral head with a quadrilateral surface plate. And how do you do that? Well, this is through the AIP window. Uh, generally, I use a four to five hole plate. And obviously, as you get closer, just in this region, we know the margin of the joint surface is between the anterior inferior spine and the iliopectinal laminate. So these two screws will not be uh, available for screws. This screw, the third screw here, is very close to the joint surface, and you'll have to direct that more cranially, and you'll need radiographic assistance to assure you're not outside the joint. Some in, sometimes you'll need to follow that plate down all the way down to the brim, and that can be useful as well to gain added fixation. The anchor screw is just up in the side of buttress. That's the, generally the first screw I put in in this region. You have to be cognizant, as Dr. Saji pointed out, for, uh, for the neurovascular structures in this region. And we're just showing the sawbone schematic. Now you can also use the pre-contour plates that have more involvement and buttressing just in this region that are available uh, commercially. And this is just shown interoperatively, just showing the combination of the subchondral rafting screws going through the anterior column plate and then the secondary quadrilateral surface plate. And this is this uh, case at two years. So in summary, we've gone through the radiology with the five out of the six uh, lines disrupted. The ilio iliopectinal line will be disrupted and the femoral head displaces with the anterior fragment. The ileoitial line is often disrupted and that can just simply be quadrilateral surface involvement with, with or without detachment from the posterior column. Or in fact, it can be displacement of the posterior column itself. Remember that a portion of the roof is intact as in contrast to the associated both column. And there can be a degree of impaction, which is usually posterior superior, but the impaction often we think is seen on the AP is usually just rotation of the anterior wall column. Finally, the teardrop and the anterior wall are involved. They're usually medialized. And it's important to quantify that impaction on the 2D reconstruction and the 3D radiographs. With regards to decision-making, the default will be internal fixation through the ileoinguinal with or without the, with or without the AIP extension, the key, it's repositioning the femoral head laterally and distally. The operative techniques include uh, impaction, and as I mentioned, and as built on from Dr. Williams' talk, is buttressing the anterior wall column. With regards to the impaction, you can do that either directly through the window, sorry, directly through the AIP approach, or indirectly through a window in the iliac fossa. And it's important to buttress this with subchondral screws and with a plate in addition to the anterior wall with regards to the quadrilateral surface. And finally, reduction of the posterior column is important, and often that is done through the anterior approach, but you may require an additional uh, approach through a posterior approach. Finally, I would encourage you to uh, concentrate on uh, these subtypes, and, and this is just uh, showing that the, uh, the real key, I think, to all of these injuries is through the uh, Lotronel textbook. So at that point, I'm going to uh, stop sharing, and I'll hand this over to uh, Dr. Mayo. Thank you for your attention.